Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today here uh, at the Human Rights Center speaker series. I've been trying to wait a little longer uh, for others to join us. But in the meantime, I'm mindful that uh, what is expecting us is a very interesting conversation. I really don't want to, to wait longer for it. Uh, so welcome everyone to this uh, speaker series on writing wrongs, the dynamics of implementing hum international human rights decisions. Uh, for me, it's a really uh, a pleasure to have uh, today uh, members of a team I had the pleasure to work with. So I'm going to introduce them. Uh, Professor Rachel Moray, who is uh, the director of the Human Rights Implementation Center at the University of Bristol, but who also happened to be the principal investigator of this Human Rights Law Implementation Project funded by the ESRC. Uh, Council in the United Kingdom. I also have on my right side, I don't know if you are seeing this that way, but on my right side is Dr. Alice Donald, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Middlesex, an expert on the European system, but also working on the Iraq project uh, at Middlesex, uh, who was also leading together with Philip uh, on the European system. And we have also Professor Philip Leach at the bottom of, of the screen, uh, the only man that you see at the moment. Uh, Philip is uh, director of the Iraq project at Middlesex University and also was leading on the European side together with Alice on our project. Uh, there are others here that are not, uh, were part of the project but are not present with us today. Uh, some of them uh, who happen to have the Essex DNA, like Anne Katrina Speck, uh, who probably might be listening to us, but in other opportunities we have had the, the uh, possibility to have her, uh, and also Paola Limon. Uh, this project was also um, where we had also as part of the project both Pretoria University uh, with uh, uh, Franchville Join, and also we had the Open Society Justice Initiative with Christian Davos. But Rachel will tell us more about that in a moment. So just some housekeeping things for us to keep in mind. The first thing is there is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions, I would appreciate if you can write them there. Uh, both Matt and Katya are going to help us take care of the questions. I will get them and we make sure we will make sure that at the time of the Q&A, I am able to put the questions to our great panelists today. Uh, second of all, uh, we are going to dedicate about uh, 30 to 45 minutes to making a brief presentation of the key findings of our project, looking at the various dimensions of the project, which included, as Rachel would explain in a moment, the UN treaty monitoring bodies, the European system, the African system, and the inter-American human rights system from an implementation angle. Uh, and then we will get into a brief conversation among ourselves, and then we will open the floor so that all of you can post questions to us and we can engage with you in a dialogue about the challenges, but also the achieve achievements in securing implementation. And for those of you who do not know me, uh, I'm Clara Sandoval, professor at the School of Law uh, and Human Rights Center at Essex. And I have had the pleasure, as I said, to be part of this uh, human rights law implementation project, also leading on the inter-American system side of things. So without further ado, Rachel, Alice, Phil, thank you so much for being with us today. It is like a dream come true. And I should say that we are also marking a very important moment uh, as part of this project and is that we recently launched, or it became finally public, uh, a piece of work that we had been working for a long period of time, that is the special issue of the Journal of Human Rights Practice published by Oxford University Press uh, now in, in September 2020, that contains the key findings of our uh, research, if you are interested in reading it. So Rachel, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Clara. I'm going to um, share my screen, I hope. Can everybody see that? It's OK. OK, fantastic. Um, thank you so much, um, Clara, and to the Human Rights Centre at Essex for, for this opportunity, and, and to Matthew and Katia for all the organisation, and also um, Clara's just made all the introductions, but just um, to my wonderful colleagues on this uh, project, Phil and Alice and Clara, and 
um, Deborah Long, who um, was at Bristol with me, um, and then we have some other researchers, Paula Limon, who was in Essex, uh, Victor Ayani and Augustine uh, Somme, who uh, worked on um, some of the African cases. Um, yeah, it's a sort of shame that it's over. Um, the funding is over, but the work continues, I think is probably the best way of um, presenting this. So I'm gonna just initially in this initial section, outline what the project was about, what we did, what our methodology was before handing back to um, everyone else to um, look at the sort of regional systems. Um, okay. So ESRC funded project, um, the purpose of it was to try to understand what happens to decisions and judgments from regional uh, commissions and courts. So we looked at the African Commission and Court on Human and People's Rights, <clears throat> the Inter-American Commission and Court, and the European Court of Human Rights, and then some of the UN treaty bodies, human rights treaty bodies. And we wanted to see what happens to those decisions and judgments um, that they adopt when they reach the national level. So when they order reparations, whether it's paying an individual compensation, amending legislation, releasing somebody from detention, or any other uh, things that the state needs to do to repair the violation that has occurred, what actually happens on the ground? Do the states do that? How long does it take? What are the challenges um, for them in trying to do that? And, and who influences um, those decisions? Um, so we wanted to drill down really into the domestic level and see what happens. So who gets to hear about those decisions in the government and beyond? Whose responsibility is it then to implement that and to coordinate the implementation? What mechanisms and procedures are available um, to uh, ensure that implementation? Um, and what influences come into play in trying to actually ensure that the decision and judgment and the reparations in them are implemented or not. So what actors are involved? So we started from the premise that the human rights systems are a very complex, complicated web of relationships and interaction between different actors and players at the national and, and supranational levels. And we chose nine countries, I'll say a little bit more about um, why these nine um, and then a selection of uh, decisions and judgments in relation to those countries. So in Africa it was Burkina Faso, Cameroon and Zambia. In the Americas it was Canada, Colombia and Guatemala and in Europe Belgium, the Czech Republic and Georgia and we had a long conversation um, at the outset of our project on why these particular countries and we had a very uh, detailed matrix of factors as to why we were choosing these particular countries and not others. And we did have others initially as well, but we, we honed it down to these. Um, there have, we chose a number of cases, um, decisions in relation to those countries, and we based our choices on a variety of different factors. Um, the intention was not to compare, the intention was to look in detail at what the processes were, who the actors were, what the influences were at the national level once these decisions were adopted. So these cases were a sort of lens through which we could examine these different uh, issues. So we looked at a variety of different things such as the political, historical and social context of the country. We tried to find some countries where there was sort of long established um, process of a democratic sort of peaceful um, situation as well as those sort of post-conflict. Um, we looked at the length of time um, from which the decision um, had been adopted, so some that were relatively recent, some that were much older. Um, we looked at the issues such as the frequency and diversity of decisions against that particular country and the extent to which engaged with the treaty body either around those decisions or around a range of other issues. We looked at the types of reparations involved in these cases. So some that were maybe just relating to one individual, so maybe releasing from detention, 
compared to other cases which were much more politically contentious and controversial and complex. We looked at cases where um, the victims, uh, maybe one victim or maybe a huge group of um, victims, and we looked at differences in terms of um, the alleged perpetrators. We also took into account whether those who litigated the case were the victims themselves or whether they were represented by sort of civil society organizations and so on. Um, so we were interested in not only sort of factors relating to the particular cases, but also the actors involved, whether that was the supranational bodies themselves, what roles they played, but also the, the national actors. So the executive authorities, um, the legislature, the judiciary, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, and other sort of media influences. Um, we adopted what we called a process tracing approach, where we tried to set out a timeline for each country um, and map the cases and political context on that timeline. So we could look at what the political situation was prior to the decision being adopted, when the case was pending, when it was adopted, and then subsequently. So we could try to then gather information about the various influences that different actors may have on um, the implementation of that decision. Um, and also get a sense of whether the state responses to that decision improved over time or actually backtracked and, and got worse. And we saw various examples of, of, of both of those. Um, and also we could then see a little bit more about the causal link between the decision itself and then any action that the state took in response um, and trying to link it back, which, which wasn't always that straightforward. We weren't always able to speak to all the parties. Some of the cases were went back a number of years or they were involved a, a large number of victims. So we couldn't speak to the victims. And so therefore, in some instances, it was not always feasible to triangulate all of the information uh, that we might want to. And secondly, um, there's in some of the um, systems, there's a lack of transparency. Um, about how this information and what measures states take in response to implementing decisions is actually collected. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this, but certainly when you look at the UN treaty bodies and the African Commission, um, whilst they do gather information around the extent to which the state has implemented the decision um, and they do publish some of that information, it's not always clear the basis on which may, they're making that assessment. So for example, one of the uh, treaty bodies told us in one particular case that the uh, decision had been 60% implemented, but we could never really figure out on how, how they came to that analysis or decision. So we had to, even where you think you have sort of solid information from a treaty body about the extent of implementation, we had to question that. Um, to see whether that actually played out with what we were finding from the other evidence we had. Um, the project was desk-based, huge amount of desk-based research, um, a large number of semi-structured interviews, sort of 250, 300 in the end, um, with a whole range of individuals um, and actors at the national and supranational levels. So in relation to each of these countries, we tried to speak to government officials in different ministries, members of the legislature, members of the judiciary, the litigants, the victims, um, national human rights institutions, civil society organizations, academics and others, and then also speak to people at the supranational level. So within these treaty bodies themselves, the secretariats, and then the sort of policy organs as well. As I said, that wasn't always feasible on every single occasion, but we did try our best um, to do as, uh, that as much as possible. We also had a number of in-country <coughs> consultants, uh, people based in the country, usually senior um, experienced individuals who could facilitate uh, those interviews and also facilitate um, in-country workshops that we had with different actors to discuss the implementation of these cases 
And then we attended um, meetings of the treaty bodies themselves and other um, meetings at the supranational level as well as a whole range of academic conferences. Um, so there was a number of academic outputs, including this uh, journal that, that um, Clara's mentioned. Um, but we've also, I think, been engaged a lot at the impact level um, in terms of feeding our findings, engaging with the treaty bodies themselves and the policy organs, um, submitting comments. For example, the African Commission and African Court both amended their rules of procedure during this time and we fed into to that process as well. Um, but as I said, the, the funding has stopped, um, this pot of funding has stopped, but the, the work still very much continues. So I'll stop there, I'll stop, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that introduction. Now I will give the floor to Alice and Phil to take us through the European findings. Great, thank you very much, um, Clara and Rachel. And it's a pleasure to, to be uh, back in our, in our team again, albeit only on Zoom. Um, so I'm just gonna speak for a few minutes to um, one uh, sort of slice, if you like, of the research that we did in the European context. So this is mainly set out in one of the articles in the special issue of the Journal of Human Rights Practice that Rachel and Clara mentioned. So, um, uh, the bit I will cover is, is uh, related to an article um, which is called The Domestic Dynamics of Implementation and Lessons from Our Qualitative Research in Europe. And Phil will also come in um, uh, in the second part just to give um, a few more, um, if you like, in our case, Strasbourg level insights from the research. So my uh, few minutes will really be focusing on the um, ground level research, if you like, that we did in the three European countries. Um, I can move on quite quickly here because Rachel's um, explained our methodology. So the main question, as she's indicated, that we wanted to answer was how, if at all, in our case, do judgments of the European Court of Human Rights change the actions and the behaviour of those who are implicated in the implementation process at domestic level. So how exactly do judgments get implemented or perhaps fail to get implemented? So put another way, I suppose we were looking in a sense at the kind of moving parts of the implementation process, looking both at the institutional architecture, um, at the domestic and supranational level in Strasbourg, the institutional capacity also of, of those actors, and then attitudinal uh, motivational factors, such as different actors perceived um, interests and incentives. Um, so we, um, just to pick up on the, the process tracing methodology that Rachel mentioned briefly there, when we were mapping out, um, in our case, the European cases, so this was roughly six uh, different judgments for each of the three states. And I should say that we did focus um, particularly on more complex cases. So cases that required perhaps a range of individual measures relating to the victim or victims themselves, but also other sorts of what are called in the European context, general measures, for example, changes in legislation or wider changes in policy and practice. So complex in the sense of requiring a range of different types of reparation and implicating a range of different actors. So we looked at um, on, the, on the sort of timeline and process tracing developments relating to the judgment itself. So when it was communicated, when the judgment was given and so on, whether in our case, it was a judgment of the grand chamber or not and, and factors that are um, sort of intrinsic to the judgment. We then looked also at developments subsequently, so developments related to implementation, um, so actions taken apparently in response, although the issue of causality I will mention again in a minute as Rachel has done. And we also looked at um, external developments, so contextual factors that occurred during that timeline that were not necessarily related to the case itself, but which had an impact on the context in which it was being implemented. So um, what that revealed, among other things, was the role and the motivations of particular actors, um, periods of, of long delay in some cases, or sudden bursts of activity. Um, and also we found um, two or three instances of what we called anticipatory responses. That's to say, when the state um, 
fully or at least partially remedied the violation even before a judgment had been given or in one case before a, um, a judgment of the grand chamber had been given. Um, we found in, in our case very few cases that I think we could say were truly decisive in terms of being the, the sole or at least the main spur for the reform which, which followed. So um, we, we found different ways in which judgments influence um, activity. They can, they can of course galvanize or accelerate action. They can sometimes add precision, if you like, to, or impetus to an existing conversation at the national level about reform. They can empower or validate certain pro-reform actors. Um, but we found very few instances, and really the three I've put here, I think, are the only ones where you would say, or, or, or interlocutors said, um, and the documentary evidence bore out, that the judgment really was the main um, or indeed sole spur for action. In other instances, the kind of chain of causality was much more, more blurred, if you like, or harder to determine, or indeed there hadn't been any follow-up or there'd been very minimal follow-up. So the, the quote I put at the bottom from the, one of the Belgian officials we spoke to captures in a way the fact that, that judgments rarely, I would say, at least in our experience, are the sole spur for action, particularly when you've got a very protracted um, flow of events over often you know, many years, a decade or more. Um, so just to pick up on um, a few of our sort of general um, findings from, from our European um, kind of ground level research. So one is that um, implementation, particularly of complex cases, um, requires, I think, in some cases, a very long time frame to be understood. So when we were doing our timelines, we didn't, in fact, just start with the, the issuing of the judgment or perhaps the communication of the case. We found ourselves going for much, much further back in time sometimes to understand the structural root of the violation, which often then continued, in fact, to bedevil the implementation process as well. So one example there um, is one of the Belgian prison cases we looked at, which is to do with um, systemic inhuman or degrading conditions in Belgian prisons uh, due to, among other issues, overcrowding. And we, we found that in, in, in talking to interlocutors who were familiar with the case and with the issue itself, we were in a sense going back decades to understood A, the root of the problem, and B, why it was so hard to resolve um, politically as well as in terms of sort of material resources. We also noticed, as I mentioned earlier, these kind of moments that were unrelated to the judgment, but happened within the time frame which sometimes cause the sort of political space for implementation to either open up or to close. And again, the Belgian prison, we looked at two different um, cases related to prisons in Belgium, were very illustrative here. That, that um, the, For example, the Dutroux affair, which you may remember, um, a, an appalling case of a, of a paedophile, caused, in a sense, the space for any kind of penal reform to get the prison population down to close for, for quite a long period and that affected um, the, the sort of preconditions for implementation. We, we looked also at the relationship between the kind of structural constraints and the possibility of individual agency. So the fact that at times individual agency may be, over, may be able to overcome such structural constraints and at other times in sense is, is kind of shackled by them. Sometimes also the dynamics of the litigation process itself, the possibility of, of repeat um, cases, uh, repetitive applications was also uh, obviously instrumental. Um, we looked, as Rachel has already indicated, at the importance of the existing domestic structures and processes and the, the importance in the European context of what's often called the government agent or the office of the government agent um, in providing kind of con um, continuity, institutional memory, and to guard also against certain judgments becoming sort of political footballs. Um, we did find very much that we had to tri triangulate the evidence we, we had, that often you have multiple perspectives from different interlocutors who were familiar with either different parts of the process in terms of time or because of the role they were playing. And sometimes, of course, gave completely contradictory accounts of the same event. So we, we did a lot of sort of checking between interlocutors and, and documentary sources. And then another general observation is also how even conscientious actions by governments or officials or those 
agencies of the state that are responsible for implementation can backfire or can have unintended consequences so we shouldn't assume that state authorities just need to kind of pull a lever if you like and the reform will follow so again the the, the very long and continuing delay in resolving the belgian prison cases was a case in, in point there that various efforts to get the prison population down were stymied or are being stymied both by judicial behavior and also actually by behavior of prisoners themselves to have resisted early release schemes, for example, for, for various complicated reasons. Another example here is the case of DH versus the Czech Republic concerning um, systemic discrimination against Roma children in schools. And there, um, well over 10 years now, efforts to implement that judgment in recent years, much more concerted good faith efforts, which wasn't the case before, but still finding great difficulty because among other issues of the fact that in a sense, parents vote with their feet. So ghettos of Roma children are still being created through um, parental choices, as well as the behaviour of schools and, and other government agencies. Um, just a last um, observation from me, I've just gathered here some of the um, pro and anti-compliance, sometimes you could call them strategies or at least behaviour that we observed in relation to different cases, both those on the left which have the effect of frustrating implementation, either deliberately, and we did find in some cases outright harassment of, of victims, for example, um, playing games with the system to some extent, um, uh, states trumpeting steps that may appear superficially to advance implementation, but do not in fact have that effect or are to some extent hollow or shallow efforts. Um, and then on the more positive side, I suppose, a range of different um, behaviours and strategies by what you might call pro-implementation actors. Um, so um, alliance building, consciously framing issues in a particular way so as to depoliticize them. Um, sometimes interestingly playing up, accentuating, but at other times playing down the kind of Strasbourg dimension, the fact that the reform is required by a judgment of the European court. Um, different ways of portraying the, the victims or beneficiary groups. And sometimes also, and this was a very big factor in the DH case in the Czech Republic, conscientious officials, but who could see that conditions were not politically conducive, deliberately, down, deliberately limiting their ambition, if you like. So going for an executive order rather than a change in legislation because they knew they wouldn't get the legislation through. So what might appear from a distance to be inaction or bad faith behavior might sometimes be good faith actions, but pe people in a sense waiting for, for better times. And we then also looked at the way in which um, different actors, civil society, national human rights institutions interact with the um, supranational level. But I think that's a good point for me to hand over to Phil. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, and I don't know if you can hear the helicopter that's hovering just above my head at the moment. I apologies if you can, I hope you can't. Um, I'm going to say some, a little bit about the, uh, the question we wanted to look at across the, across the various systems about how the, uh, these supranational mechanisms that are involved in monitoring implementation, how they do it, how do they facilitate it, how do they trigger it? And so it's a, a, I want to say a few words about that in the European context, and I know Rachel and Clara will, will pick, pick some of these issues up in, 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 their, in their discussions. And, and the place to start in Europe is, of course, the, the Committee of Ministers and this, this political body. Is it one of the fundamental differences with the other, other regional systems that it's a political body that, that has this role under the under the treaty under the convention to supervise implementation so it's state diplomats who have this role who decide uh, as one commentator has said it's is it the foxes guarding the foxes um and you know i think one can be critical in many ways of the system but i would also say i think and our, our research bears this out that there are certainly strengths and weaknesses of of that approach and, and i'm sure the others will, will, will comment on that um, and I'll come back to that uh, as, as well myself, but I think um, we also wanted to look at the role of the court in the European system because the, uh, to some extent increasingly the court has, uh, has shown its hand in, in relation to implementation. 
It's very mindful, it's very cautious about it, or relatively cautious. It's mindful of subsidiarity, first of all. Uh, it's also mindful of its role under the convention and the, and the, the, the specific role that the Committee of Ministers has uh, in terms of implementation. So it, 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 it's very cautious, but I think one can say, if, if you look back to certainly in the last 15 years, is that the court has been more willing to engage in implementation, for example, through the pilot judgments and the Article 46 judgments, where uh, the court will identify a systemic problem, it will come up with some, some, some solutions and it will be reasonably prescriptive in some cases, both in terms of time and in terms of what measures are required by the state to implement the judgment. So there's a very, very interesting dynamic there in the European system about the respective roles of the two bodies. Is the court responding to weaknesses in the Committee of Ministers implementation process? Arg arguably it is, and we're seeing a sort of stronger judicialization of the process to a certain extent. So we also looked at the tools uh, that the Committee of Ministers um, uses and of course, the, uh, the, the main process is, uh, is, the, is the regular uh, meetings that the Committee of Ministers have four times a year. Uh, they are held uh, behind closed doors, so there is no uh, involvement of applicants or victims. Uh, this is a meeting of, of, uh, of the state, and I think when we come to talk about the role of victims, as others will, in these processes, I think that's certainly one of the weaknesses, or well, there, there, there is a process of, of making uh, written submissions, which I think has, is getting stronger and is getting more, uh, more transparent. The, um, the Committee of Ministers has been grouping cases, so, which is, I think is important in highlighting systemic problems. So it will group, pull together a group of similar cases raising similar issues, say, say freedom of, freedom of the, the right to protest, for example, and it will uh, use those cases to illustrate the different problems that may that perhaps have arisen in a state in, in that area. I think that's a, that's been welcomed by those we spoke to as an important development. The, the committee has also been having thematic debates. It's had a thematic debate on, uh, on prison conditions and the duty to investigate right to life and torture cases. Uh, but those, again, are, have been held behind closed doors. I think they could be potentially quite, quite important, but it's very difficult for those of us on the outside to, uh, to really assess what, what impact those, those debates have had. So in terms of the deficiencies, in terms of the use of the tools, and again, these are, uh, we see these deficiencies across the systems, there, there is a problem uh, that, that not all the tools are, are used to their greatest potential. And we could, we can talk about in, in Europe, the infringement proceedings mechanism for, for one, which has only been used once since it was in, introduced several years ago. There is still a problem of, of uh, state non-compliance with, uh, with the various procedures that, that, are, that, are in, uh, that are used by these bodies. And I think there's, there's also a resourcing question for all of the systems. And that's to some extent, I think, true in, 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 in Europe. Uh, are there enough resources, human resources, particularly to do this, uh, this monitoring work? What's very clear um, also is, is the role of dialogue in this, in this process that uh, at the heart of, uh, of, of the way the Committee of Ministers process works is dialogue and, and diplomacy, if you like. And this can have uh, strengths and weaknesses, but there are another, a number of strengths that our interlocutors uh, told us about, and um, one of which is uh, the ability to to engage with the Department for Execution of, of Judgments, which is the, the the civil servants who assist the Committee of Ministers in this process. A number of officials in government said how important that that engagement was to be able to understand what the expectations are in terms of how you should implement a judgment. So that was, you know, one of the, one of the important um, one of the important issues. Other government representatives were were clear about the, uh, the the broader importance within the state. This is true in Georgia of being seen to engage uh, 
uh, with this in, in, engage properly with, with the process and not losing face, not, not losing uh, reputation. Michael O'Boyle, the former registrar at the court, uh, really emphasized this role of diplomacy. Uh, you're, you're, he, he told us you're trying to persuade a sovereign government to introduce some kind of reform. And if you have a body that just in, issues instructions, that's not, not necessarily gonna have a positive outcome. But um, he thinks there's real benefit in having a body that used persuasion, diplomacy can cajoles, gov cajoles governments uh, is, is a, a process that, that, is, that is more effective. So just moving on to the, to, yeah, to the final side, we're already there, thanks. <laughs> um, just a few last thoughts from, from me. Um, and one of them is about uh, when the going gets tough, what happens when the going gets tough? And, and we're all aware of cases uh, and the number of cases that we looked at uh, were difficult for, for different reasons. There was, there was a, a diff various difficulties in, uh, in getting implementation. What tools does the, uh, do, do these mechanisms have? And um, for, the, for the European system, there is this uh, possibility now of referring from the Commission Ministers from a, from a com political body to a judicial organ through the infringement proceedings process. So cases referred to the, uh, to the European Court, uh, which doesn't have sanctions as such. Um, so it's a, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a diplomatic process of exerting leverage, and it's only ever been used once so far in the Ilga Mamadov case, the case of the opposition politician in Azerbaijan who was imprisoned in Baku. And it was used in 2017 effectively in the sense that the following year he was then released. Is it possible for us to say then that this was a successful process? Well, to some extent, although we would recognize that uh, there were a number of reasons why he was released, a number of the uh, other council, particularly the Council of Europe body weighed in on that, on that issue. So that brings me to this, this also this important uh, question of fostering alliances. Um, another way in which we see these mechanisms uh, doing the job that they've got to do of, of facilitating and supporting implementation. And within Europe, it's certainly true that the, a number of the Council of Europe bodies have, have been involved in, uh, in implementation. Again, Michael O'Boyle talks about a multi-layered system with many different actors taking part in the, in the process. Certainly, to a certain extent, it's the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, so it's national MPs getting involved through, through PACE and the Commissioner for Human Rights, um, who, who's both, who's both uh, encouraged states to have a, 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 a process of um, incorporating monitoring and implementation into their, uh, into human, right, human rights action plans in, in general. And the Commission is also able to, to raise specific issues with, uh, with, with governments. Outside uh, the Council of Europe, there's also other, um, other alliances that can be fostered. And we saw the impact of the European Union actually in some cases by uh, both sort of lending political support, but increasing visibility as well of the issues and fundamentally also of funding. Uh, we saw that in, in, in some of the cases in Georgia and, and, the, and the Czech Republic. And then at the national level, promoting engagement at the national level, engaging what are the issues that are raised, engaging with national bodies. And in, in Europe, um, we, uh, we have a, a system that does allow uh, written submissions, uh, the, the, the Rule 9 process as it's, as it's called. Uh, but the reality is I think that still uh, there's a, a, a tiny percentage of cases in which civil society and national human rights institutes, institutes very, very occasionally intervene in the process by submitting Rule 9. There are, and I think there are a number of reasons for that still relative lack of awareness of the system, although the transparency of the system is, is developing, is improving. We can say more about that later. And finally, just to come back to this, uh, the, the process, the committee ministers themselves meeting confidentially 
um, which means that it, it's, it's not possible for uh, applicants and victims and those who represent uh, applicants uh, to, to be engaged in the process to really know what's, what's going on. And again, there may be, there may be pros and cons of, of, about con confidentiality, but certainly that was one of the issues that came up for us uh, with our interlocutors. I'll leave it there for the moment. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Phil. So we go back to Rachel. Thank you, Clara. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I will try and be as quick as possible, given I've already had the floor. Um, I'm just going to share my screen again. Can you see that? Yeah, OK, great. Um, so I'm just going to give um, a brief summary. I mean, there are so many things I could say um, from our research, but just a brief summary of some of the um, things that's worth flagging up from the African and, and UN systems. Um, firstly, one of the things I want to talk about, and, and Phil has um, spoken about this in relation to the European system, is the role of the respective bodies. Um, with the African system, the African Commission and the African Court and the UN treaty bodies on the whole monitor their own um, implementation themselves, um, contrary to the approach of the European system. Um, and this is principally done through written procedures, although the, the Commission has had a couple of implementation hearings and the African Court in its revised rules of procedure looks to be taking that on board. And, and as Phil said um, already, the approach here is, is principally about dialogue between the parties. Um, but if you look across the, the role that these bodies play, the commission, the court and the, the treaty bodies, it can be a variety of different things. So some of, them, some of it is about information gathering, some of it is about dialogue, um, some of it is about interpreting the uh, decision and clarifying further for the state authorities what they should be doing to implement it, providing them with some sort of technical assistance. There is some degree of assessment of whether what the measures the state has taken are adequate or not. Um, and to a certain extent, although much less so around enforcement. And at various stages, um, these bodies are doing some of these things, many of these things, or in some instances, none at all. And so what you see in the African um, system and the UN treaty bodies that we looked at is often there is a lack of coherent or strategic approach of exactly what their role should be. And in fact, when we spoke to some members of the treaty bodies, different members had different views on uh, what they think, what the role they think they should be playing. Um, and we heard terms such as implementation and follow up being a hobby, a sort of secondary um, issue compared to some of the other things they should be doing, or indeed overrated. Um, so that will give you some indication of the broad range of perspectives on what these bodies think they should be doing in terms of monitoring implementation. Um, and I think some of this can be explained because of a lack of resources around implementation. Um, the UN treaty bodies, the African Commission, the African Court, to, to a lesser extent the African Court, where there are some staff, but for the others, they tend not to have any staff allocated specifically for implementation or follow-up. Um, sometimes there are special rapporteurs appointed for follow-up, but they tend to be one individual who will then have to manage a huge number of cases. And in terms of the secretariats, often the legal officers will have a whole range of other tasks to do and implementation and follow-up is one of them. Um, and so that leads to a sort of perception that, and because I think of the way in which these systems have evolved in that many years ago, having a decision where a state was found in violation was enough um, and attention has over the last decade I think become much more concentrated on well that's not enough what happens post decision you know do the victims get some form of reparation um, implementation particularly where there is a lack of resources in these um, supranational bodies has sort of been seen as something else that has to be sort of added on somehow 
in the system, um, but often not with any additional resources. And so I think one way of trying to move this forward, uh, particularly in the current context where there are clearly not going to be any more resources given to these bodies, is to look at how implementation can be considered, considered as part of the communication process. In the African system, UN system, um, when the um, litigants submit um, their um, requests for the reparations, this is usually done at the merit stage. So it's done very early on. Um, in the African Commission, there is no separate reparations hearing. There is in the court, potentially, but not always. Um, and so putting the request in for what you want the reparations to be and having some clarity on what you want the state to do needs to be done pretty early on. And that is tricky for a whole range of reasons. People aren't always aware of that. The political context can change and so on. But I think having an awareness of you know, the timing of when this information and when these requests need to be put in is, is quite important. I think the other thing is that what we've seen in both the, the UN and the African system is that these bodies have not just a um, role in terms of the communications and complaints process, but they have a whole other broader mandate as well. There is standard setting, there's promotional mandates, there's state reporting, um, in the UN system, you have the UPR, um, you have a variety of networks with civil society and national human rights institutions, and, you know, the UN, there are the field offices. And what we saw is that often these are sort of very much untapped potential. So you've got, um, as um, Paul Hunter said, a sort of four, uh, full archipelago of variety of different um, mechanisms and that can be used at the uh, supranational level, but they often are not, or they're not used coherently. So questions are not always asked consistently and systematically of states during state reporting about what they have done to implement um, these particular decisions. And I think much more could be done um, to encourage integration of these uh, follow-up and implementation in the whole range of um, uh, mechanisms that are available at the supranational level. Um, things like the field offices is quite interesting. Um, so we did interview um, people in the, the uh, Office High Commissioner's field offices about the extent to which they followed up with the state authorities in the countries on what they had done to implement the decisions. And sometimes we had um, the view that uh, this wasn't part of their remit. Um, I hope you can't hear that. Unlike Phil, where there is a there was a plane flying, there's now somebody cutting trees outside the house. So I'm hoping it's not going to interfere too much. Um, so I'm going to say one more thing, and that's about visibility and transparency. Um, I think one of the interesting things, and this may be different from the European system, um, about the African and UN treaty bodies is the extent to which these decisions, the procedures for implementing um, the decisions and then any measures that the state take in response to them are known. And often they're just very little known. Um, the decision itself is not always known within the key government ministries that need to know about it. And part of that is because the, the medium by which that decision then reaches the national authorities is through the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and that doesn't always reach down to the Ministry of Justice or the Treasurer or whoever needs to know within the particular country. Um, the processes by which implementation, payment of compensation, for example, has to occur are often not known or whose responsibility it is to undertake that. And then secondly, lastly, the lack of uh, knowledge on the measures the state has actually taken to implement the decision. So actually, you know, for some of our cases, there was more implementation than initially appeared to be the case, either because the state did not want it to be known that it had implemented, particularly around payment of compensation. You know, we had some indication that states didn't want to make it public, that they'd actually paid this compensation because somehow that would open up 
the floodgates and everybody would be wanting compensation. Um, and so, um, and then for a variety of other reasons. Um, so sometimes things get done. We have somebody say to us, states sometimes do good things, but they don't often tell us. Um, so even if the state is implementing that, those measures are not always made visible. I think there is a need for quiet diplomacy and we definitely saw that, but there is a risk that if this, that is the starting point and not transparency, then it can lead to rumors, good and bad, about what the state has or hasn't done. Um, but I would just reiterate this, this last point, when I think you know, what we started this project, certainly looking at the African system and the UN system, I was expecting a more depressing picture than might, may at first appear but actually that wasn't the case. We saw more implementation than maybe is initially visible. Um, and I think that's encouraging. So I'm gonna stop there. I'll stop sharing my screen. Hopefully the, uh, you can't hear the tree digging outside. My hand back to you, Clara, thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that presentation too. And now I will present myself. Let me just share my PowerPoint. Okay, here it is. Okay, uh, so I thought that because uh, my dear team members have already uh, shared with you some of the findings of our research, I have to say there are many, we, we haven't had the opportunity to share with you today. I thought I will just concentrate on a case and take you through the case so that you can see some of the findings uh, we have shared with you at stake, like at uh, playing, see, see what you think about that. So basically in the Americas region, we focused, as Rachel said, on Colombia, Guatemala, and Canada. We did more than a hundred interviews, various focus groups, various other informal meetings uh, in the field, in the countries with the supranational bodies, etc. One of the cases we included in our research is the case of Molina Tyson versus Guatemala, that is a case that was taken to the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights in the year 1998 concerning the disappearance of Marco Antonio, aged 14 years old, in October uh, 1981, uh, a few days after his sister managed to escape from the hands of the military in Guatemala. She had been detained, she was sexually abused and she managed to escape. She most probably was going to be disappeared as a result of what she was uh, having to go through, but she disappeared and as a consequence, uh, and she managed to escape. And because she managed to escape, uh, the consequence was that the military went and took away Marco Antonio from the hands uh, of his mother, aged 14 years old. And this happened in October, 1981. And there starts the search for justice. You can see Marco Antonio here in the picture this is the, the, the sisters of Marco Antonio and the mother uh, looking for uh, their, their brother and their son for all of these years. Uh, this case reaches the Inter-American Commission in 1998. Uh, the case is decided by the Inter-American Court in the year 2004. And the court comes up uh, with a very holistic uh, set of orders in terms of reparation, and I have included them here. Uh, find and deliver the body of Marco Antonio to, to the next of kin so that they can bury him uh, according to their traditions, investigate, prosecute, and punish the perpetrators, publish parts of the judgment, both in the National Diary uh, of Law, but also in a national newspaper, uh, do an acknowledgement act of responsibility, name an educational center on behalf of the disappeared kids of Guatemala, uh, bring together a procedure to obtain the declaration of absence and presumption of death in relation to the disappear, adopt a legislative, administrative, or any other measure to establish a genetic system of information, a DNA bank, basically, and pay compensation uh, to the next of kin, both for moral and material damages. Uh, the forms of reparation that you see I have underlined here are forms of reparation which have been complied with, or, and I, know this, the duty to investigate, prosecute, and punish came to a very interesting point of development in the year 2018, when in May, finally that year, uh, out of four members of the military and really high ranking members of the military in Guatemala uh, were brought to justice, three of them being sentenced to uh, more than 30 years of imprisonment for the disappearance of Marco Antonio and what happened to his sister. Uh, so, but that was the first judgment in the case. 
and that judgment is currently under appeal, so it's no final. And I will talk to you about what the system is doing even in relation to that today. Uh, but in the words of Lucrecia Molina Tyson, and there is a beautiful piece written by her in our special issue, we wanted to give voice to the victims too. She clearly says there are two types of reparation measures. There are the softy measures and there are the hard measures. The softy measures were the ones that the system was quite quick to act on. And you can see it here, public act of acknowledgement of responsibility, naming the school, paying compensation and publishing parts of the judgment. But the hard ones like finding the body of Marco Antonio or really investigating, prosecuting and punishment have taken years. And of course, most probably as a result of the investigation, probably uh, the silence is going to be kept in relation to where Marco Antonio is even today. Uh, but now let me talk a bit about the dynamics of implementation in this case. What do we find that is fascinating about the Inter-American system? How does the Inter-American system compare to the other systems? Uh, despite being of all the systems, the most under-resourced system in terms of funding, but probably also in terms of personnel, uh, it is interesting that it has adopted quite a a set of tools, let's say a battery of tools that allow it to monitor, but not only to monitor implementation, but also to trigger and to make the most of the access it has to various networks to try and facilitate implementation. So in all of these years, since the judgment was handed down in 2014, the state has presented more than 15 state reports to the a court telling it what it has done in order to comply with the measures. Uh, the Inter-American Commission continues to report, of course, and has presented more than 11 of those reports. The court itself has come up with six resolutions monitoring compliance. And I want to know the importance of these resolutions. Do uh, you think that all is played at the judgment? But one of our findings in relation to a specificity is that a specificity of the reparations is a process. It's not a one moment where you say you have to make an acknowledgement of responsibility but actually is through the process of engaging with the state and with the various actors that you craft and define the terms of that form of reparation. Uh, so in these resolutions, for example, if you dig into them, you will see what the court is telling the state to do in relation to the duty to investigate and how it is triggering that process. Something fascinating, for example, is that it communicates to the state what it has to do uh, you know, we, we want this specific information, you have to create a, a clear, a, like a frame in terms of uh, who could have done it, etc. But it also at the same time uses other tools. And here is, for example, to request directly information from the prosecutors general in Guatemala. So I'm not going to go to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I'm just going to go directly to the institution that can provide me with the information about what's going on with the investigation and to get those views from the particular body to really have first-hand information that is crucial for the court to be able to do anything uh, about what is going on. Um, so those resolutions have been very important and they deal with all the forms of reparation, not only with the duty to investigate. Uh, now, very important, it, oh, sorry. Uh, it went, sorry. Uh, it, it also carries out hearings, and I want to know the importance of hearings. Uh, we don't have uh, something so established in any of the other systems, but the hearings can be both a carrot and a stick. The private hearings allowed a very informal dialogue. It's not really like if the judges are sitting down there being this body that will decide, but it's rather this mediating factor that allows the parties to discuss how can we do uh, to ensure that X part of the judgment is implemented. They can agree on plans of action. And according to our data, they seem to be even more effective than some of the public hearings. Although the data also shows that in some cases, public hearings can be incredibly powerful to, to at least stop some things from happening. But these private hearings, since they began to happen at the Inter-American Court, uh, they have really created some momentum for the implementation of judgments. And in our, in our publication, we show uh, how it happened in our cases. But in this case, they were the first ones to be used in October 29, uh, 2009. Uh, and then also, and I want to, to refer to this a special thing, 
the court not only can carry these hearings private, but it can also carry public hearings. The public hearings are the stick when the court feels that it won't be possible to dialogue, that it feels somehow to, to put against the wall the state to you know, make it public that there is something really outrageous that is violating not only what the court order in the judgment, but somehow the shared consciousness uh, of rights in the region, it really goes public. Of course, here, the organizations like Sehil, that was the key body accompanying the victims here, the litigator in this case, are crucial uh, to, to call for these public hearings to happen. And uh, they have happened, and I want just to mention uh, a very important uh, situation where this happened in this case. Last year, so after in 2018, it is decided that these guys were were punished, were to be punished, although the, that there is an appeal at the moment uh, of the decision. Uh, the Guatemalan government wanted to pass a law basically granting, again, some kind of an amnesty to these guys. So basically going against not only Molina Tyson, but all other decisions of the court against Guatemala concerning human rights, gross human rights violations that occurred during the armed conflict, where it ordered the duty to investigate. And the civil society was quite quick to go to the court and say, come on, we need a, a, a public hearing on this, but we not only need a public hearing on this, we also need provisional measures. We need you to stop an imminent uh, violation from happening, you know, there is an imminent danger here that all that you've done, that all that we have built with so much effort can literally go to pieces. Uh, and the court held both the public hearing where it brought Guatemala and questioned Guatemala about that national reconciliation law amendment that it wanted to do. Uh, it has not been approved, it is still there, but it has not been approved. So you can see that at least the decision of the court in this case, uh, the resolution, the public hearing, uh, as well as the provisional measures, some kind of uh, have an impact on the state, halting the process it was uh, engaged in. Uh, but also, I think it's also important to say that as a result of the fact that the decision of the local court is on appeal and that the perpetrators are trying to use different tools to try to, for example, secure uh, not incarceration, uh, claiming health problems like happened with Fujimori, et cetera, and now more during COVID and the like. The court has also been asked to, through provisional measures, to please don't allow this to happen and actually request Guatemala to act fast to decide on this appeal, you know, and to avoid you know, impunity to continue to reign. So you see the permanent engagement of the court uh, in this process. Uh, but the other thing that the court has done, not in this case, but I would like just to mention briefly, is that the court is also ready to go on site and visit with its own eyes, you know, the communities uh, that are benefiting from its judgments to see what the state has done or not. And I think this is crucial because most of the supranational bodies are really deciding in Geneva, in Strasbourg, in Costa Rica, in Washington, but they don't always have direct access to, to reality. And I think this real call is fundamental to facilitate implementation and to see how you can uh, trigger changes. This has happened in particularly in relation to indigenous cases, a few in relation to Guatemala, like uh, Plan de Sanchez and Rio Negro, but it's also happening in other, in other cases like El Mozote, Again, massive gross human rights violations, but they are proving pivotal and important. Also in relation to cold cases where things have not happened for a period of time, doing that type of visit seems to create new momentum uh, for implementation. But then I would also like to re refer uh, a bit quickly to uh, the domestic dynamics and to the international dynamics, uh, and perhaps just uh, leave it there uh, with my comments, and is this. Something that one sees in the case of Molina Tyson is that uh, implementation is a multi-actor and a multi-factor process. Uh, the court, as Alice was clearly saying, I cannot say that the court was the, the one that made possible, for example, the investigation in the case, but certainly it was a triggering point of that investigation that linked with other important developments and with a key network, an ecosystem of people that certainly included the victims, 
uh, made that possible. So in the case of Guatemala, the existence of CICIC, for example, uh, this special uh, UN uh, commission in order to, to fight impunity, but also to investigate these economic crimes uh, was crucial. Uh, pressure from the United States was absolutely crucial uh, to really uh, bring these uh, trials to account. But also the work, and I want to know this, and, and uh, Lucrecia Molina Tyson says this in this piece, and I can say that is absolutely the case. Without victims, there is no truth and no justice. And I think a part of the uh, achievements of the inter-American system is the way it has given voice to victims. And this puts apart the inter-American system from the other systems, the UN, the European, and the African. While in them, we have some expressions where victims can have a voice. In the inter-American system, I would say participation is absolutely central. And by linking directly to them and to the networks of support of victims, these alliances become fundamental to achieve changes, even if they end up happening uh, at a different, uh, you know, slowly, uh, etc. The other point I want to make is that a case like Molina Tyson also puts on the table the distinction, but also the relationship between implementation and impact. So we see implementation of a judgment but we also see the impact of one judgment of the court in other cases in Guatemala. So issues like the uh, potential uh, passing of this law on national reconciliation to allow an amnesty is not something that would affect only the case of Molina Tyson, but that has the potential impact to affect, you know, the investigation of any other case. So a decision by the court in one case really has a butterfly effect that will definitely uh, impact the structural conditions that allow impunity to reign. So I think this is important. I think the court is absolutely um, clear about the need to seize key moments, you know, key opportunities. You were talking, my colleagues were talking before about these key opportunities that arise are seized by these bodies and they can use it to empower others. Uh, or to link with others in order to stop a state from uh, doing uh, well, doing uh, some things that we believe are not are not uh, correct. Um, and there is, uh, for example, I, I, I felt that I wish there was more clear criteria as to how these tools are used and when they are used and when you can actually request them. That's one of my criticisms to the system. But when I think about that. I think that the system also needs to be very flexible about it because it allows the system to have a real time response to situations. And we see it, for example, in the case of Guatemala with this case, but we also saw it in the case of Fujimori with Peru, or we also saw it in the case of El Mozote with El Salvador. So that quick reaction of the system, again, seizing the moment is something that uh, we can definitely not, uh, not underestimate. And certainly the pre-existing conditions, as Alice was mentioning before, determine in, in big part uh, how the politics of implementation are going to play. And in a country like Guatemala, where impunity continues to reign for gross human rights violations, it remains a major issue. But I, I think that the, the nice message that comes out from a case like Molina Tyson is that you can see that a supranational body that in principle you would see as with limited powers to transform a reality can really provide uh, empowerment to those actors that on a daily basis can make a national change. And I think that that articulation is something to, to continue studying and continue uh, reflecting on. And I just forgot, and I'm just gonna quickly say this, but I forgot to mention another key tool that the Inter-American Court has, and is the possibility to join uh, uh, orders of reparation like the duty to investigate in various cases to monitor jointly the implementation of that measure. And that happened actually in Molina Tyson, 12 cases where the court had ordered the duty to investigate concerning gross human rights violations that happened during the armed conflict were joined. While the idea is key, our findings do not allow us to conclude that it has been an effective tool. It does allow to, to shine light in what is going on, you know, to understand better the problem. For example, this uh, articulation of the 12 cases has allowed the court to understand where are the problems in the domestic system in Guatemala, but that does, but it has 
does not necessarily allow the cases to move further on in terms of investigation. Indeed, none of the cases has been considered to have been fully complied with in terms of investigation. Uh, I, I said, you know, Molina Tyson is still there, although there are progress, Minamac, there, are, there is progress, but there is no final full compliance. And another problem that this prioritization of some measures have is that you somehow relegate other forms of reparation uh, to which you will not give the same attention. And this is, of course, a natural consequence of a system that is understaffed and that has to decide what am I able to, to supervise, what am I able to trigger here, uh, rather than looking at the whole thing. So, well, but with that, we finish. I know we are, we run out of time, but let me thank you, Rachel, Phil, and Alice for your time, for uh, this uh, fantastic, amazing project, for sharing some of the insights with uh, the Essex people and others that joined us today, and for our audience for listening to us and staying this long. And thank you to Matt and Katia for all they did to make this uh, work today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Clara. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.